So, I'm Stefan Hante. I'm a mathematician. And this is me throwing a noodle. <laughs> now, why did I do that? Well, that's because this is what I'm doing at work, figuratively speaking. <laughs> of course, I'm not getting paid to uh, toss noodles. Um, um, but I'm uh, simulating uh, a flying spaghetti. Now, why am I simulating spaghettis? Well, it's because you can imagine that uh, a spaghetti is like the little brother of more important structural elements of buildings and uh, all around you. Just like um, these uh, cables with the nice little birds on top, or these steel beams that uh, make up this bridge, or even a garden hose. But why do I want to simulate these things? Well, consider you want to build a car. This is a picture of an uh, engine compartment, and inside there are a lot of cables and hoses. And of course, uh, you don't want to spend uh, too much money for material, so naturally you want to make the cables and hoses as short as possible. But on the other hand, if they are too short, then there will be um, large forces acting on them, and then they won't last long and they will break. And you don't want that to happen. So you need to simulate uh, these things in order to make sure that they hold up long enough and uh, that they are as short as possible. Another example where uh, this can be very mm, important are these wind turbines. Uh, they consist of uh, long metal pieces, and uh, they all uh, can be simulated using uh, the same um, beam models. And, uh, of course, you can go ahead and build uh, some uh, wind turbines and see what happens if there's a big storm. Maybe they'll, they'll hold up, maybe they won't. Uh, but, of course, you don't want uh, them to break, so maybe it's a better idea to simulate them in beforehand and to be sure that they won't break if there's a storm. Because if we want to do green energy, we better do it right the first time. Okay, um, today I'm here to explain to you how uh, am I simulating these uh, flexible beams and rods. And this is done using mathematical models. And I have tried often to explain this to my colleagues and friends, and uh, uh, I often failed because I lacked some nice vis visualizations. So I sat down and made some uh, so you can understand this. In order to describe a flexible beam or rod, we first need to talk about how a general flexible body uh, can be modeled. And to do that, I uh, have chosen this delicious jello block. Uh, so to give you a three-dimensional impression of the block. and. Well, to describe a flexible body, we first uh, need to know how to describe it, of course. And uh, the idea uh, is to say, OK, this flexible body consists of material points. And if I know the location of each of these material points, then I know how the flexible body uh, is situated in space. That's the classical approach of continuum mechanics. But around 1900, there were uh, the French brothers Eugène and François Cossera, uh, one was an engineer and one a mathematician, who thought maybe it's a better idea to not only consider the position of these material points, but also their orientation in space. And in order to visualize the orientation, I have used these three arrows, and each arrow points in uh, the main direction, or in a main direction uh, of the material point. Okay. So now the flexible body consists of these material points and that are, have a location and an orientation. But maybe now we need to focus on one of these material points. But material points are a little hard to visualize, so uh, I took a nice plane. Because we all know uh, what a plane looks like. And as I said, uh, the position is important and the orientation. Now, the change of position is called translation, and translation is very easy to do for mathematicians um, because this just works like adding numbers. Um, the orientation, on the other hand, is a little bit more difficult. 
we have uh, three main axes of the plane, and the pl plane can rotate around each of this, uh, these axes, and um, the rotation around one of these axes uh, has, has name. And the rotation around this axis is called the roll, the uh, rotation around this axis is called the pitch, and the rotation around uh, the upper axis is called the yaw. And if we now measure how much the plane is rolled, pitched, and yawed, um, we uh, have then three angles that describe how the plane is uh, oriented in space. And in order to visualize this, I've used this gimbal here. It consists of three rings um, that are connected with hinges that can rotate. And each of these rings now represents one of the uh, rotation directions. The inner ring is co uh, connected to the rolling of the plane, the middle ring is connected to the pitching of the plane, and the outer ring is connected to the yawing of the plane. And now with this description of orientation, we can describe every rotation uh, that is possible. But this description of orientation has a serious problem uh, when we consider uh, things uh, with large rotations. See what happens uh, when the nose of the plane pitches all the way up. We can see that the hinges uh, of the inner ring and of the outer ring are now aligned. This means that if I now roll the plane, um, it rotates around the same axis as uh, if the plane would yaw. We can even pitch and, uh, no, sorry, uh, we can even roll and yaw the plane at the same time without changing the orientation of the plane. And in mathematics, we call this a singularity because now there is an, an axis, this one, where we can't rotate around this axis. If we would uh, do this, we would break the gimbal. So we can see that this description of uh, orientation um, has a problem, and we need uh, another description of orientation. And this is where it gets really interesting, um, because if we want a, a singularity-free description of orientation, we need to go uh, in higher dimensions because we can imagine orientations to be a curved space in higher dimensions. Of course, this is really hard to visualize, so I just used the glass ball here. Uh, and we can imagine that each point inside of this glass ball now describes a particular orientation of the plane. Um, I have shown a, a little black dot inside there, and if we move this dot, then the orientation of the plane changes as well. Now, if we simulate anything that uh, involves rotation and we want to describe it in a singularity-free way, like this, then we need to make sure that uh, every, um, every configuration we calculate is inside of this glass ball. Because every point inside the glass ball represents an orientation, but outside, we don't know what it means. Uh, so we need to make sure that we stay uh, inside this glass ball. And this is where geometric integrators come into play. An integrator is an algorithm to solve equations of motions. Um, this means we essentially use uh, the ge geometric integrators to simulate an object. And the geometric part means that we conserve some geometric property. So to speak, uh, we make sure to stay inside the glass ball. OK, now we have talked about a single material point represented by a plane. We have talked about uh, the general flexible body, and now I want to talk about a flexible beam or rod. OK, first, let's take a knife and cut it in the middle or somewhere, and we get a cross-section. And again, there are a lot of material points inside of this cross-section. And again, we need to know the locations and the orientations of them. But since um, my beam is very long and not very wide, we can assume that the properties won't change a lot inside of this cross-section. So I'll just go ahead and just use one material point here. And I can do this uh, for every cross-section. And now I can describe my beam using the center line of the beam and the orientations at each point of the uh, center line of the beam, 
we have uh, a rigid cross section attached, and the orientation um, that is attached to is describes how the cross section is uh, situated in space. And this is how we describe our beam. Now we have simplified our model, uh, but still there is an infinite amount of, of information here um, because this curve is smooth. So um, we need to further simplify it, and uh, this process is called discretization. We just use uh, a couple of points um, to approximate the whole beam. And well, this is very abstract now, but there's a nice uh, interpretation for this because uh, we can interpret each of these material points as a rigid body. And if we do so, we get a chain of rigid bodies that approximates our actual beam. And uh, of course, now I've only talked about the description of, uh, on how to describe the beam. And uh, I get a little bit more. I also get uh, how uh, these rigid bodies um, interact with each other. And we can imagine that they are connected with something like springs. So they approximate the behavior of the real beam. OK, now you know the basics. And now you can sit down, spend two years, and figure out the details and implement this uh, in, in a programming language, and then you get the flying spaghetti. Uh, I've shown here a simulation uh, of a slender beam uh, in, in blue, and we see in red the uh, trajectories of the endpoints of the beam, and it flies through space. And on top, we see the simulation time. Well, of course, this is only. Uh, spaghetti and it's not a, an important structural element uh, like a steel beam um, but um, we can use this test scenario to test our geometric integrators to test our algorithms um, there are a lot of uh, important things about these algorithms one thing is the energy behavior if we want to simulate uh, long uh, time spans, then we need to make sure that the energy does not decrease, of course. Um, but the most important thing uh, about these algorithms is their efficiency. Not only do they need to be accurate, accurate and precise, but they also need to be fast. Because for bigger models, computation times can be about a week or even more. So uh, we need to be accurate uh, and precise, but also fast. And um, by using this uh, flying spaghetti test scenario, I will uh, I make sure that the algorithms are efficient. So the next time you drive across a bridge or you are in an elevator that is supported by a cable, maybe you think of me sitting in my office throwing my virtual spaghettis and trying to make the world a safer place. Thank you.